People are going to lose their minds. This is a moment in history unlike anything humanity's gone through. It's a very different world for humans to come. Take a step back and see the broad picture, which is the way all these technologies are interlinked. Because this is all about exponentiality, and humans can't think in exponential terms. How consequential do you want to say machine intelligence is? It's almost certainly as consequential as writing. How long did writing take to disseminate through the human population? You know, hundreds, thousands of years. And we're dealing with it now on a scale of months. But in this kind of world, you're compounding 100% growth every year, and the numbers become astronomical. AI is going to spot patterns in the world that were just completely invisible to us. Even if you think that the AI and the robots are your demise, you might as well bloody invest in them and make some money out of it. If not, you're just going to be angry man shaking your fists at the clouds. So you don't want store of value to be money that is exchanging hands on every small transaction. That's not store of value, that's cash. I am very excited to be chatting to Alex Gurevich. Um, most of you probably already know Alex, uh, but for the few who don't, he's the founder and CIO of Honte Investments and the best-selling author of The Next Perfect Trades and The Trades of March 2020. Alex, good to see you again. Uh, how is life in the Bay Area? Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on and a pleasure to chat. Um, it is overcast, otherwise pretty good. Why did you decide to locate yourself in the Bay Area? Well, that history... Apart from because you can, right? Yeah, the history goes back almost 20 years. I felt I was still working for J.P. Morgan when I like, when I moved up, out to the Bay. I just kind of felt like I wanted a change of scenery. There were sort of like personal reasons, and I did want a change of scenery, honestly, from New York City. And at that time, I, I thought that California was a pretty good time zone for macro because I wanted to have more access to Asian time and to, like... Late in the evening, you can even get a little bit of Europe opening. Mm -hmm. Honestly, over the long run, it's not such a huge deal which time zone you live on, but I felt like I could do okay from California, and I wanted to kind of get away from the buzz and the clutter of the trading floor and have like more time to contemplate long horizon trading strategies. You know, for some reason, I always think of you as a Bay Area guy. I, 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 you know what it is? I think it's because your background is mathematics. And I somehow, I got a lot of friends who were at Berkeley and they did stats or mathematical subjects and they loved it. It's a Frisbee center. One of the things it's a Frisbee, and for some reason, mathematicians seem to disproportionately play Frisbee. Anyhow, let's go on to what we're meant to be talking about rather than whatever silliness that occurs to me. How have markets been treating you? Um, what's been working and what has not been working? Well, it's been definitely a very educational several years since the beginning of pandemic during pandemic and post pandemic and markets do have a unbelievable quality of being humbling to people especially when you get very confident i had this like long running joke that there are mornings when you feel like totally in control like you wake up and you think like everything is great like at last, all the pieces are falling into place and all the economic data supports my view and the price action is exactly what I expect. And you like look forward to next morning to confirm your views. That always precedes a huge loss and everything <laughs> going wrong. Yes. You know, it's been a long time since I had the feeling that everything was going right. <laughs> so maybe it's a good thing, right? So, yeah. so that's been very educational few years. And I obviously, I wrote a book the trades of March 2020, which capture, captured our experience in pandemic. And humble as I tried to be, there was still a story of successful year of trading 2020 and how we navigated pandemic. There were You could find a lot of bloopers in this book, like because we did the whole um, transcript of, we did the whole transcript of all our internal trade chatter in March 2020, day by day. Like, And there is a lot of like, holy craps there, right? And a lot of, right. oh no, we messed it up. We just bought this, we need to sell it, right? And so on. So there were a lot of mess ups, but overall it showed, I think it's, this book was really, very good at showing the process and it was eventually a successful process. Like risk managing, uh, making some mistakes, pushing some positions that work in our favor, having some ideas, creating a view. So 
I, I, I come out with this book. And of course, like when you do that, immediately markets turn difficult. 2021 and 2022 were very difficult years for me. And in 2023, so far, I felt I got a better handle of the markets. So I wrote an article kind of trying to summarize what lessons I've learned. And it was specifically focused on understanding inflation after after post-COVID inflation and what was were the mistakes of Team Transitory and what Team Transitory got right and how it affected my own view and how it affects my perception of what's going to happen in the future. Um, so what what exactly... You know, what did you learn about the inflation dynamic? What what changed from from that experience? Well, this is what I understood. If you, which I don't think I understood fully before, but it was very by analyzing from both top down and bottom up, I understood how much of an impact the falling factor has. If you're looking, what is the biggest input in knowing what will be the inflation next month? The, oh, the inflation input, this month. Exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, right? It's the inflation is the biggest input on in inflation. So what Team Transitory thought in 2021, okay, we're having, of course, we're going to have a spike of inflation. Okay, it turned out to be a little more than it was, but all of us expected it. Nobody was super surprised that there was a post-COVID growth rebound and inflation spike. Maybe people, I was... In terms of supply chain disruptions, I was more worried about them early on in 2020 and didn't really time them right for 2021. So I probably was blindsided by that. But fundamentally, none of it was a huge surprise. And Tim Transit correctly thought that that effect would wear off and bull whip. So first we'll have the spike, then we'll have a come off. The problem was that what was the misunderstanding is that when inflation goes up like it did in 2020, 2021, sorry. For any reason, it doesn't matter why the inflation is high. If you have 9% inflation and 0% interest rate, it creates incredibly expansionary monetary environment, minus neg negative 9% real rate. That's crazy. On top of super expensive monetary policy, rising asset prices, weaker dollar. So you had a complete storm of inflationary pressures. And it does not matter why. But when you create this type of environment, it's going to create other infl secondary inflationary effects, which are going to be more entrenched. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. You know... So sometimes people say that uh, no one could anticipate the supply chain disruption, or nobody did. Um, so at the risk of, of uh, angering the gods and showing some hubris here, um, we actually did get that right. Uh, we, uh, MI2, wrote a piece called RIP Corporate Capitalism. Forgive the hokey title. Um, but the gist of it, one of the points we made was that supply chains had been optimized for efficiency and the minimization of capital employed and not for resilience. So in this, during the Second World War, those supply chains were all optimized for resilience for good reason, right? You, you really want resilient supply chains if you're fighting a war. But um, if you have all been to business school and done an MBA, you realize there's huge gains to be made by optimizing for efficiency. Um, and I think that's what people did in these the interaction of the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy. These supply chains were all completely integrated. So one small hiccup and everything suddenly goes haywire. So that was one. And then the other thing is we we run some, we call them models, but they're probably just correlations. We, 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 run, we run quite a lot of models. And we saw an inflation surge um, early uh, in, and then, you know, became easy for us to say, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. Um, but implicitly, yeah, that, does that mean you think that the inflation surge that we had is gone now, that it's, it's over and we're moving into a different kind of environment? Yes, and I actually think I extrapolated to see that we'll have a deflationary surge. And this is how am I thinking about that. So in... Economy works on two-year cycles, and later I want to show maybe a chart to prove it. Um, 
In 2021, we had an incredibly expansionary environment in every respect. And that created certain sticky inflation effects. So when that original supply inflation reverted itself, we're still having strong labor market and various other like services inflation and various, I don't need to lecture on the sticky inflation points that were created. But the opposite of that is likely to hold true as well. Many people say, well, inflation came down sharply from like whatever 9% to 3 or 4% because of just unwind of those supply chain disruptions. It means nothing in terms of actually taming core inflation. That's mm -hmm. the inflation camp says. But to that, I will answer just as we saw that it does not matter for what reason inflation came up in 2021. It's not going to matter for what reason it came down in 2022. It will create a secondary disinflationary effect. When the real rate is going to go from, and it already went, from negative 9% to positive 2.5%, that will have effects, which not only we don't see yet, we could not possibly see yet. That's why I'm kind of totally flabbergasted. Even Powell talks about this. And when I honestly, when I hear people talk about economy resilience to interest rates, I think I'm in a house of lunatics. Because when people say things like economy withstood the rising of interest rates, I'm like, what planet I'm on? Because we don't know. It's not that they did or it didn't. How can we possibly know? That has not happened yet. Like Powell, even in his last speech, he talked about raising interest rates by 75 basis points in first half of 2022. So they, yes, they raised interest rates to 3% when inflation was 9%. So they contracted real interest rates from negative 9% to negative 6% in a huge hurry. How is it supposed to be crush the economy? if you still have negative real interest rates. They only became positive a few months ago. So we could not possibly yet judge. Like the, the point is what really ups, not upsets me, but my pet peeve is that people think that the jury is out, that the jury already made a judgment on how the interest rates affected the economy. I actually have no idea yet, and I don't know who does. We cannot, pos it's very possible that the economy will prove to be resilient and there will be no recession or whatever. Recession will be very far away just on some, for some other reason. All of this is possible, but we don't have the data and we cannot possibly have the data on that yet. So I'm really struck by the way your analysis is very monetary policy focused and you, you don't refer to fiscal policy at all. Uh, when I try and make sense of what I've seen, the story I tell myself is very fiscal policy focused. Um, so why is it you're not looking at the fiscal components of this and focusing primarily on the monetary components? Well, fiscal policy is a little more ambiguous in terms of how it operates. And it's a little harder to say when it's a contractionary, when it's expansionary. For example, if you go from $3 trillion deficit to $1 trillion fiscal deficit, does it mean that you contracted fiscal policy or it just mean it's still expansionary, just less expansionary? Secondly, I think there is a huge difference whether in the fact whether fiscal policy is being accommodated or not. So fiscal policy obviously was what created the inflation wave, not the, it's the stimulus checks. It's not the interest rates alone created this thing. But when you have treasury expending a lot of money, they have more debt. If this debt is being buy, bought by the Fed, that debt just turns out to be money into the system, right? And obviously it increases GDP, just in every way stimulatory, stimulative. When you have government debt increase and treasury increasing issuance through either increasing the interest rate liabilities or increasing their general fiscal expenditures, but treasuries are not accommodated by the Fed. In fact, interest rates are going up and treasuries are being sold by the Fed. These treasuries have to go somewhere and they have to go to either domestic or to foreign holders. Now, if all treasuries, and this is where I have a trouble with modern monetary theory, which really think that treasury is equivalent to cash. Theoretically, that would be the case if there was no banking regulations. So if banks could hold infinite amount of treasuries, banks can use treasuries mostly as cash. As someone who has worked for a bank, I can assure you it's pretty easy to repo to your notes. And if 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 you have no, if there is no boss, if I'm running a asset swap desk in JP Morgan, as I had, right? 
and there is no boss coming. You have a 75 basis point charge on your balance sheet. Like if no charge on your balance sheet, you can really keep expanding your balance sheet and do wonderful things with it. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, once you have a charge on balance sheet, you suddenly start scratching your head and not do want to do wonderful things with this balance sheet. Because I was like, I cannot take a 75% 75 basis point charge on balance sheet. I only make 30 or 40 basis points on my balance sheet. So, so Alex, so, this is, sorry, carry on. Well, go ahead. What did you want to say? So I was going to say, I'm in the weird position of profoundly disagreeing with one thing you say and profoundly agreeing with another. Um, so your point about banking supervision and its importance, I, I, I can't emphasize how strongly I think that's a really important observation that everybody misses, including most central bankers. Because most central bankers are not banking supervisors. Most of the people we see talking about bank uh, supervision, about monetary policy, are monetary economists or economists of some stripe. Um, but actually, the banking supervision is critically important all the time, um, particularly when we've got a constraint. Honestly, that is the most unambiguous way to ease on the tighten policy, is sure. to tighten or loosen banking regulations. This is the most unambiguous way to affect monetary policy. It's, it works faster and more surely than interest rates, hikes, or balance sheet changes by the Fed. Because once banks can, if banks can expand their balance sheets, there is more cash in the system. Absolutely. When banks cannot buy incremental treasuries, they have to go to end users. And users could be foreign investors. If foreign investors are going to be buying those treasuries, then they have to buy dollars to buy them. And that drives capital account surplus, which in turn drives current account deficit and has to hurt exports for the United, for United States producers. If domestic users buy them, it has to displace other investments and so, displace other asset classes. So there is a either displacement or capital account effect as, as soon as banks are tapped out on the balance sheets. Banks and hedge funds maybe too, like well, when this whole, but hedge funds still borrow balance sheets from banks anyway. So it's the same. It's same, same thing, problem. ultimately, yeah. And then the, the source of all that balance sheet ultimately is a central bank. Yeah. Um, which will lend its balance sheet if you're, you run out of balance sheet. Yeah, so so that's that, yeah, it's all it's all interlinked system. So how the system is being regulated and how it is allowed to grow. But having said that, there are some regulations and there are some limits. When there is a lot of treasuries out there and they get over flooding, it's not so stimulative anymore. Secondly, going forward, I actually don't really have that conviction that interest rate, that fiscal policy is that expensive. Because again, it's not as expensive in 2020. So if I, for example, say, well, it's still expense expansionary, but not as profligate as I don't use it as a negative word. It's more like really like sending out checks to everybody was an extreme, probably a correct thing to do. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that it was a very extreme measure. So, I know that this question extreme of the part. scale, question of the yeah. scale, like the checks, I would say the checks they sent out to poor people, you know, people with kids. Um, those were not, wasn't a particularly expansionary policy. The checks they sent out to employers on behalf, because they maintain their employees, including, for example, there's a famous case of Tom Brady receiving, I think, a million dollars worth of checks or something. Those may have been over the top. It's hard for me to say. Yes, it, it, it's hard to judge, and I really don't want to be, like, I'm, I'm not qualified to analyze this. And maybe the, I think, overall, COVID slowdown was dealt with, and there was some price to pay in terms of inflation, and maybe there will be other waves of price to pay for it, but I would say, like, they tried to do what they could. I wouldn't judge people at this point. They you tried know, to do what they could. I'm, and, I'm, not, I'm not good at... Nobody should take their moral advice from me. I'm not... So if it's a morality issue, let's. I need to step away from the question quite quickly. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. So anyway, so what... Uh, all I'm just trying to say is that like the net fiscal impulse is really not clear cut for me. And I uh, and when you add all those effects, fiscal effects, I'm not really sure how they all add up. How does the effect, and we can d dive deeper into that. Like how for, what if, for example, the like of going, interest rates going up, right? What is the yeah. effect of that? Yeah, so I'd like to dive deeper in that. For one, I, I'll push back. Um, because so 14% of GDP, according to some measure, 18% on the other, was the extent of the deficit relative to GDP during COVID. Last time we had that, we were fighting a war against Germany. Um, 
So th that's a big fiscal stimulus by any measure. But even now, I just checked, and the number I saw was close enough to like five and a half, six percent of GDP uh, in terms of the current deficit. Um, and what that resulted in is a uh, if you look at interest as an like th th that's one factor. The other way of looking at the same thing is to say that uh, uh, debt to GDP in the U.S. went from maybe lows of around zero at one point during the Clinton administration to uh, sorry twenty percent or so to a hundred percent now. So if you go from twenty percent to a hundred percent, the impact on the federal budget of interest rate increases changes dramatically. And so what you have now is a movement from zero to 5% as a really rough order of magnitude shift. Um, you've gone to 5% of GDP as an interest expense. Now, I've, I've exaggerated because obviously the debt doesn't all turn over short rates and, you know, at the same short rate. The stuff matures and some of it's long dated. But interest expense now is roughly speaking just below defense spending. Um, and I would say that if we don't do anything about that, and the CBO agrees with me, by the way, mind you, being agreeing with the CBO is generally a bad sign. The CBO is generally wrong about all of its projections. But uh, the CBO says that uh, deficit uh, debt to GDP will hit 132 in some 132% in so many years. Um, and I look at each of these components, and I can't see how fiscal policy could go down. Like defense spending now is 3% of GDP. Um, in 1986 or so, before you know the Cold War supposedly ended, um, it was six percent of GDP. So, like as a first guess, I'd say six percent makes more sense than three percent, right? It's just because we're in an unfriendlier world. People are spending much more on weapons around us. So, all of this seems to me to suggest the idea that fiscal and, and the other thing you asked this question about. Supposing you're spending two trillion and then you go to one trillion, is that uh, contractionary or, or expansionary? It's ambiguous. I, so all the economics I learned, I'm not I'm not proud of that. I, I would have preferred to study mathematics, but all the economics I learned said that's definitely contractionary. But if you start off with this huge fiscal stimulus, you shouldn't be so surprised that it has some follow-on effects. We we last time we were at five percent a deficit of 5% of GDP was in 20, 2009. And before, sorry, 2009, during the GFC. Before the GFC, we didn't do it for like 20 years. It was like the previous high in the fiscal, uh, federal deficit. So these are, we're, we're at really big levels of the federal deficit now, and we have been for a long time. Um, so I'm for me, that's got to be part of the explanation for... The surprisingly, de the surprising degree of robustness in the real economy. Anyway, I've, I've ranted on for too long. No, I know that's uh, it's it's okay. It's good that you framed this argument. And I gave I had a lot of soul searching around this argument, not just around this interview. I've thought about this argument for now several years. About the argument that if um, the Fed raises interest rates, just that simple argument that the Fed raises interest rates doesn't it just put more money into the system, right? Which is in fact instead of being contractionary would be expansionary. Right. Now, there is something to that, but there is three hurdles to that. And the first hurdle is, so this is interesting what you mentioned, how right now we have very high interest rate expense and very low budget spending. So fiscal deficit is like a balloon that you can push on in different places and it might expand on others, right? So the question is, and this is a very important mathematical question. What else is being equal? Mm -hmm. So if I go from, if interest rate expenses go up by trillion dollars, what is what do we hold fixed? All other expenditures or the total budget? Now, if we hold total budget fixed, that means that we'll spend trillion dollars less on other things. In this case, interest rate expense will probably be contractionary because other things will probably be more stimulative with interest rate going into through bondholders, right? If, however, all other expenses are fixed, then all of a sudden we have $1 trillion more budget deficit and we could argue, though I will not go there, but at least through this first hurdle, you can argue that it could be expansionary. Now, my opinion that it's a blend. Think about a family which decides whether like a middle-class family 
which decides, should I spend $5,000 on this vacation? Suppose they don't spend $5,000 on this vacation. Does it mean that they're going to be $5,000 richer? Not really, because what they're going to do, they're going to say like, well, we saved up some money, but now we can have some nice dinner or now we can do something else. So will they? So probably they will end up with a little bit more money at the end of the year, but not five thousand more, but two, three thousand dollars more. There is some kind of multiplier. So what I think happens in budget negotiations is that when you introduce a new line cost of hundred billion dollars, it does not mean that the budget stays the same, but it does mean it expands by hundred billion dollars. In the process of negotiation, something else will probably get pinched a few billions. So it's very hard to judge when you expand interest rate expense, whether it's contractionary or expansionary, because that pinches other areas. And when interest rate expenses will go back to zero again, when they go to negative real rates again, which I have firmly convinced that we will, when interest, well, real interest rates will go, sorry, when nominal interest rates go to the natural place of zero, and inflation will go to its natural, slightly positive rate, government net interest rate, real interest rate expense will become negative and they'll be able to expand other areas. So actually having a debt would be a great thing. It will be a source of income for the government again. So I actually see no problem in the long run with um, some expansion of debt to GDP ratio. I think it will be good uh, for a budget in the long run. So, so, yeah. so uh, I just want to say, this is just sure, the first sure. hurdle. I want to get to more hurdles. But okay, go, say, go. Uh, no, no, hurdle, no, 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 you, you carry on. This is very interesting. Go, go. So now there is a second hurdle is something that I already mentioned, the displacement thing. Suppose it does increase by budget deficit. Suppose when you increase interest rate expenses and you add a trillion expenses and say it increases 500 billion in net fiscal deficit. That means 500 billion more treasury issuance. And if that issuance is not accommodated by the Fed, if the Fed is not buying those treasuries, they go somewhere. And that's something I discussed earlier. How much counterflow they create by counterflow they create to that expansion they create by displacement or by driving dollar high and driving exports lower. So um, that's the second hurdle which we already discussed. And then, and then at last, now, let's assume that these two hurdles are passed and it's somewhat expansionary, but then we have to get to the third hurdle of actual effect of interest rates on the economy. Now, I this is another thing I've learned over the last two years. Unfortunately, even though in some sense, theoretically, it should have led me to predict the original bank crisis, I couldn't predict it precisely, but I was prepared for something like this to happen. And this sure. is what I want to explain. I think people focus when interest rates rise People focus on how vulnerable are people with over-leveraged balance sheets, vulnerable players, people short on cash. They analyze it and they see, well, actually, there is not that much vulnerabilities. Consumers are still okay. Household balance sheets are still okay. That was true in 2021. There might be some deterioration, but I don't think, like, people might diverge, but there is no horrific picture there. And people say, like, well, if people are flush with cash, how does raising interest rates hurt the economy? That's the argument I hear a lot. But this is what I've learned both by, by anecdotal observation over the last couple of years. What happens is that it's not the weak players that will drive the economy down. It's the strong players. Mm -hmm. It's people with a lot of cash will drive the economy down. Why? Because they will make a choice to contract their balance sheets. When you are a business or an individual, and you can fund yourself at negative 9% real interest rates. You're going to borrow all you can and buy your inventories, make investments if you're a person, buy real estate, whatever, buy real estate and pay like 2.5% mortgage with 9% inflation. You're going to do it galore. Now, when you see real interest rates switch to positive, and they only just did it, but the process actually started in 2022 of some individuals opting to say, and companies opting to say, you know what, I have this revolving credit line. In, I'll, instead of making that next investment, I'm just going to pay down this revolving credit line. I have enough inventory. I don't need to take more inventory loans. Let me see if I can pay down some of my loans, which are now I'm paying 7, 8, 9% instead of 4 or 5%. That process has only started. And this process, or that is the process which created the banking crisis in, 2000, in the spring of 2022. The 
or was it spring of 2023? I already lost track. When was the banking crisis? 2000. So you more know, recently, yeah. right? The yes. Silicon Valley it was, banking it crisis. It feels like March it was 2023, this year. right? Yeah, yeah, it feels like it was it this feels year. Like, it feels like three years <laughs> ago, right? But I, I'm not a good guy to ask on this. I can't remember no, no, any anniversary of my like, wife complaining about It's just a few months this. ago, but it right, feels like it was right. three years ago so much transpired, right? right? But, uh, the shrinking of balance sheets by strong players and suddenly weak players like the whole tide goes out thing, right? You know, the tide went out and people by good, strong plays by pulling money out, exposed weak players. I think the same process will happen in employment world. We're not gonna see employment collapse because of, just because of bankruptcies or economic shrinking or like, it's not gonna happen that economy will slow down and then employment will collapse. So consumers will stop consuming and employment will collapse. No, employment has to lead it because with real wages are doing well, employment, job market really robust, consumers will keep spending, corporations will keep doing well. So to me, honestly, every number, economic number I see, like retail sales, durable good order, manufacturing, I was like, blah, 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 blah. The only thing I'm looking right now is unemployment numbers. That's the only number that matters because that's the only number that needs to crack for things to turn down. And I believe even with the recent reports, I'm still not convinced that it's cracking because there was a lot of false positives on that. Like there was a lot of times like, oh, employment is weakening. Look at those jobless claims. Look at those jobs. Oh no, this goes back up. Like we have to really give it a little more time. But I believe that the process will be not because weak companies going bankrupt. It's because strong companies in the environment of two and a half percent real rates will have to increase productivity, which they had no incentive to do two years ago. It will be a slow process of reduced high. Wages are going up and they will keep going up and companies will eventually start getting by with fewer employees. There is a lot of redundant jobs and these jobs are, I think there are some signs of this and very, very weak signs of that possibly the process beginning. When it will begin, it will be the tsunami like we've never seen before. The deflationary tsunami of job loss in this country will be probably my guess on a par of like 1930s. So, uh, I, I think I, I'm at the limit of my ability to unnest statements, but um, I'll, I'll try and do uh, your observation about uh, the deleveraging of wealthier balance sheets is a, is well made, and I think uh, people who've followed the Japanese deflation experience. Would, would pat you on the back and nod because that's exactly what they experienced. It was a demand for credit that collapsed in Japan, not the, su not the supply of it. And this is how a deflationary balance sheet generally works. So there's guys who focus on this, and you can look them up on uh, economist Richard Koo, I think, gave an interview for Real Vision. He's a guy who's most familiar of how this process works. Um, so I, I totally take that point. Um, where am I might disagree with you it's partly on the political economy of it um so i just don't see a political consensus forming around smaller deficits in the us the easiest con easiest uh, uh political solution for any problem you have in the us is to spend more money and there are some really good uh, really important projects that the federal government has out outlined already, including some kind of new industrial policy that I think uh, will be prioritized. So you, you hinted at something the economists call crowding out. Um, and then you hinted at also uh, the MMT, the problem of the problems of MMT. I hate talking about the problems of MMT, um, partly because uh, the people who look at MMT are very uh, detailed focused. If you ever talk to Warren Mosler, and you really should, uh, he's a very smart guy. Um, uh, he's very pedantic. He will out. Well, I listened to his presentations, so right. I have not talked to him directly, but I've I've followed him. Yeah, so he he's and excellent. I took a lot of and trust me, I took a lot out of it. Yeah, I, I get always get a lot when I look at Mosler's yeah. comments, Mr. Mosler's comments. So hat tip, hat tip, Mr. Mosler. But um, uh, so one of the observations I'd make is that uh, you're right. If we allow, if the federal deficit slows, the growth in the federal deficit slows, what you describe as a deflationary impulse on wealthier people deleveraging could easily overwhelm everything. If it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if rich people delever. That's uh, private sector can delever. If the public sector is relevering them, 
then we're going to be overwhelmed with money to buy assets. And there's nowhere else. Dollars don't, until you delever balance sheets, dollars don't die. If you, if the federal government shoves that money into the system, the balance sheet gets relevered until we delever it some more. So that push and pull, um, I don't know how it resolves, but I do know that we need to, we've got some really big government projects that we're going to undertake. And all of the dissaving that's taking place in the US today, it's it's government dissaving. It's a federal deficit which is expanding dramatically. And it's not even as if I disagree with why that expansion of the federal deficit is taking place now. I, I think they're right. These things are priorities and they're not going to be deprioritized, even if uh, the wealthy choose to de-risk their balance sheets. So that's that's kind of where I push back. Well, um, okay, so um, first of all, I want to, it's not even like to me, that's not a pushback because I fundamentally agree with you in the sense that if you ask me, what is the greatest risk to my view? For example, if I want to, if my view is to be long duration in the United States, so bad on lower interest rates, what is the greatest risk to this view? I would say the risk is, Political risk is the greatest because the government can always create inflation if they sure. want to. If they really, if their goal is to create inflation, they want to. Um, and it's a question of velocity of different processes. Now, this it might come down to just a matter of opinion which process is going to overwhelm. Experience of past decades shows that cyclical forces usually overwhelm everything. So my, I'm betting on 40, the fact that, 40 to 50 years. Yes, experience. my yes. yes, my experience, and but and and I will actually, in a moment, I'll show you a chart which makes me think that things have not changed. But um, I think the cyclical forces, you, it's always pays to bet that cyclical forces will overwhelm everything. Because yes, probably, as you say, government will keep expanding its pro programs. It'll probably happen whenever we have unified government, whether it's Republican or Democrat, they will push some something, some kind of fiscal expansion. Whenever it's a gridlock government, maybe they'll slow down on a little bit. The thing is right now, what works in my favor, I think, is that right now there is so much fear around inflation and people have not yet started fearing deflation. And anything that they do now will be so lagged that we have to think of conditions right now are going to create what we're going to see in 2024 and 2025. And I think conditions are very contractionary right now. So I think in 2025, cyclically we're likely to see deflation because of conditions put in place now the kind of fiscal i don't think fiscal expansion right now will catch up to balance sheet reduction that the way we see it right now now if something radical will happen after 2024 election uh, we might see different things but i think right now because of gridlock policies the opposing parties has enough kind of ammo to say we cannot do this because it will be inflationary and so on and so forth we need to watch the budget as you say, eventually, yes. Eventually, minimal wages will go up. Various other inflationary political measures will be put in place. But that process, I think, will slow, and it could be, and and it will be countermanded with various other very powerful secular processes, like which. And some of this fiscal investment might actually lead to increased productivity that, in the long run, might prove to be deflationary. But looking out ten years ahead is not so productive for purpose of portfolio investments. I think the best horizon is two years because it's just too hard to predict what's going to happen 10 years from now. I mean, I'm okay. There are certain investments that I will make with longer horizon, but two to five year horizon is usually the best. And I think on this horizon, the cyclical process will move faster than any fiscal process will. Um, can I ask a question about that? Because, well, what are those certain investments that you will make with a longer term horizon in mind. And what, what determines when you say, yeah, you know what, right now I want to focus on the five year, not the two year. Well, uh, some investments, well, one of the investments that's, uh, there are many of them, but a simple one that I can explain in investments like hard assets. Like for example, you can buy things like, and that could be both more industrial and more precious. Um, it could be investments like, um, silver, gold, platinum, palladium, or it could be investments like copper. And I mean, long before, I don't know if people remember, but somewhere around 2003, palladium was traded 
at like two hundred less than two hundred dollars an ounce. And I bought a whole bunch of it working for JP Morgan and people asked me how long are you gonna hold it? And I was like, well, till it goes up. This is not sustainable. Platinum was like was like, I don't know, like seven times more expensive. Like it was just a crazy ratio. I don't remember what the ratio was, but it was yeah, like insane yeah. ratio of platinum to palladium. Like that's not gonna last. Yeah. Just as I believe, by the way, right, the inverted layer of palladium to platinum probably not going to last. And that is decades-long processes. And you just say, like, well, look at silver dynamics. So silver is trading, like, um, in low $20, right? It will, used to be the high of 44 What are the chances that it will be at 50 or 60 in the next decade? Pretty high, in my opinion. But uh, it's very hard to predict what silver is going to do in the next year or two. Yeah. It's the scaling of that bet that makes it right. difficult, not the statement. The statement that silver will trade at 60 at some point seemed perfectly valid to me. The problem is how do I scale it now that I haven't gotten rid of it in two years' time? Yes, yes. So even the scaling and portfolio management and how it correlates to other things in your portfolio, all of this has to be taken into account. But in this case, what is interesting is when I look at stuff like precious metals or cryptocurrency, or I don't even look at like what are the fundamentals. What is the fundamentally the price of silver or gold should be? I don't think there is any fundamental way to establish what the price. People use all sorts of uh, arguments to establish what gold should be worth and what Bitcoin should be worth. And honestly, when it goes to like, and I, I don't want to be offensive to people when people actually try to calculate what should be the price of Bitcoin. To me, that's a little hilarious. It's it's not so. I'm not sure it's significantly better modeled by the analysis or by Brownian motion. Um, yes, they all well, seem roughly the same to me. Well, what you can do, you see, fortunately with gold, you have several thousand years of history, and silver too. You can yeah. look and see how they can possibly trade in various scenarios. Yeah. So to me, all I do is I look how they can possibly trade. When I look at cryptocurrencies, I also see, well, I recognize in the cryptocurrency trading pattern, the trading pattern of precious metals. That's what caused me to get on, like interested in cryptocurrencies several years ago and write an article in search of digital gold. When I uh, wrote about what feature, what made gold, what are specific features and bugs which made gold gold and which of those crypto, crypto assets possess. And sometimes, I, in my opinion, people confuse what is a feature and what is a bug. And we can go on, go into this if you wish, but I it, it I started to look at that and I started to see, well, if you invest modest amount on certain assets and you see the potential patterns of trading, like for example, we just talked about silver. Can it go to zero? Yes. Can it go to 60? Yes. If I buy it at 20 something, the historical pattern of trading silver shows me that there's a good chance of having good return on capital on it over the next few years. It's all about getting good return on capital in yeah expectation space obviously everything do you know i just want to say this i already made a few really strong statements in this speech and people should know when a macro trader says something i am sure there will be a deflationary bust i am sure rates are going to zero what i really mean you have to have a little translator there caption yeah, what yeah, I mean, yeah. there is a 52 percent chance of that happening yeah yeah absolutely I, I, I want to just tell you a silly story then i want to probe a little bit on this cryptocurrency thing because i don't really know about crypto but i um, when I was uh, getting married to my wife, I gave her a set budget, right? And this has got to show me in a terrible light. I'm a terrible person. Just in case anyone didn't know, I'm terrible. Now we can move on. So I gave her a set budget. And uh, she wanted to buy herself a pl platinum ring, a platinum, like, wedding band or engagement ring. And uh, with the fixed budget, she didn't want to – she said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to get him a palladium ring because I know he doesn't care about jewelry. You'll notice I'm not wearing anything right now. He doesn't care about jewelry. He can have a palladium ring, which is like one fifth the price of my platinum ring. Guess whose ring is worth more now? Yes. <laughs> Does that mean? Well, I can assure you, I always bought palladium jewelry whenever I had a chance to because I knew. <laughs> it's just the absurdity that makes me giggle. But no, that's, that's, that's so, a funny story. So, on the subject of crypto, so I know so little about crypto that people wheel me out just to say, this guy doesn't know anything about crypto. I'm, I'm the standard of who doesn't know about crypto. Do you tell me about crypto? Should I should I put money in? I've, I've implicitly got a position because I have some private equity investments in people like Gemini, um, which, by the way, i got to say, I look at that and I think to myself, what was I thinking? Oh, my God. But regardless, what, what, what do you think the future of crypto is? 
Well, so first of all, I am also not at all an expert. And uh, crypt and even like things with blockchain, after all these years, I still get confused about them. So like I don't have this deep understanding of what is going on there. All I look and look is honestly is at the chart. Like in this case, I'm not generally a technical analyst, but all I know is Bitcoin is a chart of Bitcoin. <laughs> Literally, like that's the end of my knowledge. And then some bits and pieces around it. To me, it's just important to me. And when it comes to other coins, I really don't want to talk because I really have. Well, I talked about this a little bit because I, for example, I wrote about Ethereum being as digital copper. Mm -hmm. Like we Bitcoin is digital gold, if Ethereum is digital copper. And I discussed why it is gold and not copper that is used as a store of value. And I just like what I would say is like, think about this. Do you want to invest in gold and what features gold has? Why did gold win as a precious metal? Why is it not silver, not platinum, not copper? Why is gold one of the store values? There are actually fundamental reasons for that. Gold, there is a lot of gold, but not too much of it. Just the right amount above ground gold. Gold is sufficient. Gold has some indust industrial use to anchor it somewhat and some industrial jewelry use, but it's not huge. And that's actually a feature, not a bug, because for metals who are mostly used industrially, like copper, it's not going to be driven by its store of value, by monetary policy. It's going to be driven by technology and technological demands. That's not an interesting store of value. The interesting store of value, which is driven by liquidity. So gold is has good because gold has some value so you know it's not going to go to zero right because it has yeah, some use yeah. very useful properties it's the densest metal it has some hygienic properties and so on but it's also plentiful enough that some kind of industrial need will not going to drive it one way or another we have a steady but small new supply of gold so gold will not be too deflationary in the long run which is by the way people think that shrinking supply of bitcoin is necessarily a, is a feature that could actually prove to be a bug no, I think what it's I a think bug. is the best. Is, I think you want to have like a steady low supply, which is there is some similarity. Gold is more and more expensive to mine. Bitcoin is more and more expensive to mine, right? So that type of setup. But I think having like a steady trickle in supply would probably be the best for long term store of value. For example, being able to transact on it, but not too easily. That's a feature. Like you can pay with gold, you can carry gold bars on you, but it's not very convenient. You don't want your store of value being something which is too easy to transfer. In my opinion, Bitcoin is a little too easy to transfer, but the but because Bitcoin transactions are a little slowed down right now by block blockchain, that's actually a good thing. You don't want to have to something which is too easy to transfer because then it's easy to steal. It's like carrying wads of cash in your wallet, right? You want something which is hard to steal or confiscate. People can have money and say like gold in their safe, but also you can carry it if you need to. So that's a really good balance of density of gold made it really useful for carrying value, but it's not super convenient. So you don't want store of value to be money that is exchanging hands on every small transaction. That's not store of value. That's cash. No. Also, Sorry, you want yeah. also, you do want something really volatile relative to dollar. Because when people say, I find it hilarious when people complain about cryptocurrency that it's too volatile relative to, that it's too volatile. I was like, well, there is a great way to store money if you want something which is stable against dollars. It's called dollars. It's dollars, yeah. yeah. And if you want to really uh, store it in crypto, then you can use stable coins. The whole point of store of value is to be volatile against cash. That is, when money expands and cash becomes less valuable, your store of value thing goes up in price. That's exactly what you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so all of those. So, what I'm saying is like, I, my narrative probably doesn't sound particularly bullish or bearish. I'm just saying that there are upside potentials like similar to those which might can be created on precious metal space, and the longevity depends upon street credentials of being a, a store of value. Will in the future Bitcoin? survive as a store of value will it and the argument that it's limited supply and therefore it has to go up in price is nonsense this argument was made about beanie babies or whatever the, because there's tons of things that are limited supply my nail clippings are in limited supply so if i 
So I don't know uh, if your nail clippings are in such limited supply. I well, my nail think. clippings are. There is only okay. certain amount I can produce during my lifetime. It's, it's true. If I if I launched a futures contract based of it, I'd have deliverability problems. I think. Yes. It, so true. so yeah. So so limited supply in itself does not really prove that anything is going to go in price. But I feel there are potentials potential to go up in price if it survives as a store of value. Then you have to look at how the store of values trade. And what I think is happening is a trade similar to precious metals, but on more compressed timeline. If you want to inv invest in precious metals, you might also be interested in investing in crypto. and might compare the risk returns and like where they are on the charts and so on. So I, I one of the reasons why I, I asked you this question is I thought I got the impression you had written a book on uh, a crypto issue. Um, and I was trying to tease you out into discussing the book you, I thought you'd written. Now, maybe I did that in a bad, in a half-hearted, oh, ham-fisted way. Um, but I'll, I'll be more explicit. Tell me about your book, Alex. So, so this is this is not just my book. There is a book that so anybody who is interested in crypto should have a look at this. There is a consensus network, which is a Bitcoin publishing network, and uh, they're coming out this uh, very shortly in a few weeks, and already it's available for pre-sales. Maybe you can show the cover if you have it on. Yeah. This is called 21 Futures, Tales from the Time Chain, which is the first ever Bitcoin fiction stories uh, anthology. So what it, what, what it does, it has uh, several stories which discuss in a science fiction way how the future might look with Bitcoin in it. And I'm just one of my, uh, one of the stories there, which is called Are We or Are We Not, is my story. There are several other there's 21 actually, it's 21 futures, so there's 21 stories in this anthology. And I really think that probably anyone who is interested in crypto is going to end up reading this anthology, so you can just as well order it now. So, um, you know, I, I should discuss, talk about this with people more. I don't really ever kind of talk about crypto because um, I don't really have anything useful to add. But when I do the thought experiment as to what the use case is, the only possible use case I can think of uh, is to export capital from places which are trying to restrict the export of capital from them, like the People's Republic of China or the Islamic Republic of Iran. Because if I wanted to hide my purchases of drugs and prostitution services from the federal authorities, Bitcoin is a really poor tool. Not, by the way, I don't really purchase much in the way of drugs or prostitution services. I should. Have. This was a hypothetical, just in case. For the record, for the record. Okay. Yeah, for the record, and for any NSA officers who are watching. But uh, if I wanted to do it, Bitcoin would not work. It, it keeps a record of all my transactions, which is the very last thing I want. Um, and the United States government, I believe, probably can uh, decrypt anything it needs to and, and find anything it needs to. Um, so it only really works because we're hoping the People's Republic of China's government does can't do that and doesn't have that capacity. Um, and there it does work uh, if you're, a, say, a Chinese local government official and you stole $20 million. Using Bitcoin, you can be pretty certain that you'll get $10 million of it to Vancouver so your mistress can use it. Um, it seems to me that will be a, the, the certain use case. All the other use cases I'm unsure about. It seems to be well, a private money, and I don't know if private well, money is work. I want to be very specific because that's what I talk about. I do not think that Bitcoin specifically is heading towards being a currency and active use cases. It's use cases as a store of value, not to facilitate transactions. And you mentioned that some of the store of values are good for large money transfers, so much and clandestine, and like clandestine money transfers or semi-clandestine. It's not so much clandestine as protected money transfers. And right. this is really what it's what I. So at the risk of spoiling my story just a tiny bit, I want to, what I ex wanted to explore, the aspect that I wanted to explore was a society with a complete loss of digital trust. For example, right now, how do you know that you're talking to Alex Gurevich, but not to some AI um, representation of me, which just read all my articles and just synthesizing how I would answer the question? I've, it's almost possible already. It's like we're on the verge of somebody being sure. able to impersonate me with AI. And if we're so close to it, then surely in two years we will be able to. You see, in my case, I like to believe that my sense of humor is so terrible that it'd be quite hard to uh, quite hard to simulate. 
but maybe I'm wrong to think that. I think you're too. Yeah, you might be a little. You, you might be humbled by that. <laughs> so, so like, how do you know when you receive an email from your coworker that it's an email from coworker? How do you know when you talk on the phone with somebody and you recognize the voice that it's actually the voice of your friend? How do you know when you are calling your banker that you actually call your banker? So, how do you navigate society with a loss of digital trust? And I feel like. To some extent, the society is coming. It's unavoidable. The digital trust will be harder and harder to manifest. And uh, I wanted to explore how people will cope to that with that. And we're, we're going to need a digital cryptocurrency comes yeah. into that. How you can deal with w- what is the role of crypto cryptocurrency in general and blockchain more in generally in the world with with a loss of digital trust. Yeah, we're going to need digital credentials that we can trust. And uh, yeah, I can see that. Um, what uh, what else would you like to talk about? What's in, what's topical right now? Then what's got share of mind with you? Well, let me show you the chart that I showed because a lot of people, of course, always want to talk think about like what stock market's going to do, what economy is going to do. So to conclude this, let me show this chart. This is my favorite chart. This chart has kind of has been my bible over the last uh, since I discovered it about ten years ago. Maybe I discovered this chart. And it's been really the bio, my investment Bible. So there is an uh, orange line and the blue line. And you see, so the blue line tells you what is the yield of the, it's basically the difference between the yield on a 10-year note two years ago versus the yield on a 10-year note today. So as you see, it's super negative right now. You see the shaded portion of it, it's super negative because the 10-year yield went up in unprecedented fashion. So let's back, look back on, on interest rates. And then the orange line is the look forward on stock market. It's a subsequent two-year percentage change in the stock market. And as you see, we don't have it on the shaded line because we don't know it yet. We know how, how uh, 10-year yields changed over the last two years. We don't know how stock market will change over the next two years. But as you see already, you see the blue line recently started to go down. It was really high up. What well, that means is that it's really high up. If we really look at the last spike on the blue line, that was in, in uh, 2020 when the yields fell dramatically down between 2020 and 2018. And it created this huge, enormous spike in the orange line. What does a spike in the orange line mean? It means that stock market compared to the lows of 2020, it went really, really high up. And as you see right now, stock market, as the blue line came down to flat, stock market came down to flat. What does it mean? It means that as uh, if we go back two years to the end of 2021, the interest rates were roughly flat back then relative to the end of 2019. And the stock market performance subsequently from 2021 to 2023 was roughly flat. And as you, what I'm basically saying is that two-year lag of interest rates can be very well seen in stock market. It's not necessarily, stock market is not economy, but it's just a good proof of how interest rates work their way through various factors. And you see it paints a pretty grim picture for stock market yeah, if yeah. this fit will continue. Now, there is a caveat. It's a cherry pick chart. It starts on the end of 90s. That fit was not as good since uh, before that at all before the end of 90s. The whole concept, this chart is really the chart of risk parity, if you wish. It was, in the end of 90s, people invented risk parity. I invented risk, I, I came to risk parity independently in 2002. I didn't know other people were already doing it, but I started to do it internally in JP Morgan. I still have my presentation that I made for management on risk parity at that time. So, and I had exactly the same definitions that other people did because it was just, the greatest trade of our generation, right? There is par- risk parity. Yeah, free one alpha. of the greatest trades in the history of financial markets, I would say. Sure, sure. So, so this is really, so some people say, well, maybe we're in a different environment now. Well, I'm looking at this chart over the last two years and saying, prove it, because so far it looks awfully the you same. You know, my working, if I were to argue, I would say the risk parity works when you don't use fiscal policy. When fiscal policy is... Uh, uh, subordinated to monetary policy, because then every time you get uh, a problem, you know, the central bank is going to run a counter-cyclical policy and there's only monetary policy to worry about. So it will work just fine. 
when fiscal policy breaks out and they start to re- aggressively use it to achieve policy objectives, it might it might not work going forward? Might it might now? You know it what? Might. I'm but not I'm brave enough so to far, say that. As of today, as of up today, the fit is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And you see, orange line can stay above blue line quite a bit. It does not mean that stock market necessarily has to go down 50% from its highs, uh, but down 20 or down 30% uh, two years from now from where it is today seems to be the likely outcome given this chart, unless things change. So I think there is a headwind ahead for stocks. And generally, I never bet against stocks because to me, that's more like a reason to stay flat than to be short. Yeah, because I, uh, I in the long run, stocks will always win. In the yeah. long run, no matter like what squiggly lines you draw, uh, stock market tends to go up somehow. And maybe again, fiscal policy might break this chart in some weird ways, like we could have higher rates and higher stock market forever. But as I said, so far so good. The chart keeps going. And the interesting thing that so I discovered it. So it's not like the chart that I'm writing, r- drawing right now to prove my future view. I wrote about this chart in my book in two, that I wrote in 2014, my first book, The Next Perfect Trade. And that chart persisted since then. And it's oh. persisting very well as of today. So uh, I'm yet to be convinced otherwise. No, I wouldn't really want to bet money against it at this point. But uh, And I tend to share your view that stocks, I don't really understand why so strong. And neither do I really understand why real yields are so high. Um, so though, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm leaning in any direction, those are the directions I'm leaning in. But I know uh, that we were meant to talk for a certain length of time. We've talked for a little bit over that certain length of time. Probably a good time for me to just re- just say to you, thank you so much. Um, I found that really stimulating, uh, really thought provoking. I hope anyone viewing it does as well. And it's always great talking to you, Alex. You're a, you're a sharp man. You think about markets, um, which is not so common, sadly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me over and for having a great conversation. Oh, I'm glad you say it was great. A lot of I don't get that as often as I'd like. <laughs> Let's see anyway. what the viewers say. <laughs> exactly. Thanks so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.